what's going on guys and yeah thank you chat artemis steve how dare you miss last week because last week's episode made many people sick uh but anyway Tonight, frontline gaming blog writer and 40k crusade expert Sam Duguid joins us. Let's look back at the last week in the Warhammer community. My name is John, and it's pretty grim after dark. Uh, my co-host today needs some introduction. It's re <laughs> He's refreshing the Warhammer community page every Sunday to see when nights are coming. And it's Danny McDevitt. <laughs> well, we can tell who's back in the producer chair today. God. Danny. Condescending intro music never ends. It takes like forever. <laughs> it does sometimes. Sometimes that tricky dick produces. Um, so, yeah, Danny, so much news from the last week for us to talk about. Uh, what are you excited to talk about today? I hope to God I put it in. Yeah. Uh, well, since, you know, as usual, I haven't read any of the notes or scripts or anything. So uh, uh, I don't know, John. I'm just excited to be here once again. Yeah. Well, Good, good. I'm happy to have you here once again. Uh, Danny, we get to talk about uh, the improper use of intellectual property tonight. Uh, oh. We get to talk oh. about an imperfectly perfect balance update. Uh, we, talk, we talk about furries. Uh, I know you're a super fan of those. I am. Uh, we're going to dive into the competitive dictionary. But Danny, uh, why don't you go ahead and introduce our guest for us? Hopefully they have equally condescending music for introduction. Um, so, uh, tonight, uh, we're pleased to welcome, uh, FLG writer and, uh, personality. Uh, you may have seen him all, not only have you probably read his articles on, uh, on frontline gaming's website, uh, where he goes under the moniker, uh, Lord Paddington, uh, like you bear, also may have seen him on Fabricator really. Forge. Uh, so tonight we're pleased to welcome, uh, Sam Dugan. Thanks Sam for joining us tonight. Oh my God! <laughs> Jesus Christ! <laughs> Thank you guys for having me. We actually had a very elaborate intro that was planned, but due to a miscommunication, we, and I would like we, to completely blame the hosts here as somebody who has been on many podcasts. I have never. It's usually quite like this. Yeah. Famous guest, uh, Lord Paddington here. Uh, and just to say, we did plan this cool intro where we knew Val was doing the thing where the TV would drop mm -hmm. down and at the same time, cool. Sam slide would in. slide in from the side with his chair. But 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 he producer Val was actually it. muted the whole time. He wasn't listening to us, much like no. you guys shouldn't yeah. listen to us here. It's mm -hmm. an awful thing. Uh, guys, we're, we're going to start tonight. We're going to take it aside here with a personal request. Uh, guys, Chaos Knights are out of stock everywhere. Uh, and what better way to try and round out my evil nightly house than with this? Uh, small, small request uh, for John to literally, I just want to buy two Chaos Knights. Uh, they're out of stock everywhere. Uh, we see, guys, if you are missing the live show one, check out the live show, at least uh, the, the feed on YouTube here. Uh, it's a little charity thermometer with a one level and a two level, because I want to buy two desecrators. <laughs> I would like to buy two nights. Danny, I know you've prepared for this heartily. Uh, can you read from the very real and very <laughs> prepared pledge script we put down uh, for our Chaos Night Drive? Uh, wait, what? <laughs> We have Go a pledge please. drive here. Uh, we we have uh, two chaos nines that are needed to successfully fund our pledge drive. Yeah, uh, look, I'm gonna need you to, to read from the script to, to get it more. If you think about it, a chaos knight player goes without a chaos knight <laughs> once at least once a week, um, and this is a problem that's plagued that's plagued our society now for weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks, maybe even three. Um, and it's especially affected our host John. He uh, he's down on his luck. Uh, he doesn't have the capability to just go out and pay more than retail on any kind of night. Look at him. I mean, well, he's to be fair, he's devastated. He has the capability. He just really doesn't want to. And thank you, gaming co-op. I don't want to pay three hundred dollars for yeah, a night. Yeah, and look, the hmm. stress is making his hair fall out, guys. Like it's <laughs> uh, it's clearly gotten to him. Like, please just you... help out, help out our host. Um, it's it's just. I can't God, even find the spell guy. I'm at so him. mad. He looks terrible. Buddy, <laughs> jokes about my hairline are not allowed per the style guide that you agreed to uh, on this here. Good Lord. 
Good lord. And yes, UNICEF would copyright strike us for, for using their uh, money here, or their music here. Sam, uh, just pull you in here, is there a model that you've wanted that you just couldn't get a hold of because it's been out of stock? Oh gosh, I'm trying to think. There's been several. Um, I think when the Dark Eldar release came out, there was always, I think it was Drazer um, was one of those models. I mean, it, you know, sometimes when they come out in those box sets, you think, like, oh, now I've got time. It's a terrible box set. When the, when they, whenever I need it, it'll be there for me. Um, but then, you know, suddenly they've become the most broken thing ever and you can't find them. So, yeah, I'd say definitely Drazer is one of those ones that still to this day sticks with me. I still need to get one, actually. <laughs> yeah. Danny, when did you learn uh, to just accept <clears throat> the, the fear of missing out that GW promotes and just buy everything that comes out? Uh, well, as, uh, as, as, as a whore for Games Workshop products, naturally I buy most of everything that comes out, um, uh, which has put me in terrible debt. Um, but I would say the, uh, the, the model that I'm, that I most, uh, miss getting out that I most, uh, like I was having the hardest time getting, uh, was your mom. Mm. <laughs> Oh, jokes on you. She's a uh, core range. Um, <laughs> what guys, what edition uh, was that? I think that was before I started playing. <laughs> it was a wrong it trader. Was, yeah. <laughs> it was the late nineties, man. I was just uh, okay. into hobby. It was old. It was a rogue trader era <laughs> model. People still try and use it. It's coming back like squats. Mm. Retro is cool again. Like your mom. Um, guys, what is, what's been, and this is for you both here, starting with Danny. What is the most frustrating model to get a hold of? Like, do you have like a memory of trying to buy a model and just being unable to get it no matter what? Uh, you know, okay. And this is, sorry, this is going to sound uh, really bizarre, but it was also Dark Eldar models. Uh, Dark Eldar mm. racks in plastic mm. have always been super hard to get a hold of. So um, I still only have able to purchase like four boxes of those. <laughs> only. It's so rare. I've only been able to amass twenty of them. Yeah. Uh, so, so what about you? Is, is there been a model that you're like, I need this? Oh my god! Oh, yeah. Where is it? So one of the ones I, I'm going to dip into the past here a little bit and go with the Sisters of Twilight on a Forest Dragon Ooh. from Warhammer Fantasy because that was that was always one of those models I'd, I'd always wanted. I started a small Wood Elf army when they got their their latest book, which was released for everybody who gets mad about you know a codex or an army book being released. And then a new one coming along like six months, four months later. Try getting a new book and then the entire game ceases to exist six months later. So that's what happened to me with my nice little wood elf army. Uh, and then after that, I kind of lost the, the taste for trying to, to find it. And then the model was gone. But I managed to get one like about two years ago. I found it on eBay. I managed to get a decent price for it. So nice. Yeah, it has a happy nice. ending. Nice. And yeah, yeah, Chad, I read you 3D print my mom. Ha ha, very funny. Your mom goes brr. We, we got it there. So <laughs> moving on, we're going to begin tonight properly. Uh, not, not with the begging of a host, merely looking to exchange hard-earned American dollars for a simple model. Uh, but with this... <laughs> Nope. <laughs> but with this, next slide. Wonderful. A really excellent thumbnail from last week's show, uh, showcasing last week's episode titled Warhammer is Completely Fixed with a picture of Bob the Builder and with Fix It Felix. Um, <laughs> we did get this feedback, though, on the next slide that I will ask for you to play now. Amazing. Cool. Uh, so saying, so you have secured the licensing to use those IP characters. Uh, Danny, did you remember to clear this thumbnail through legal? No. <laughs> fair. Um, and, and of course, fair, fair use laws mean we don't have to. But Sam and Danny, <laughs> what is the worst crossover uh, you've seen with Warhammer 40,000? Of course, we had Fix It Felix and Bob the Builder there. Uh, we've seen a lot of other kind of uh, Warhammer X other things. Sam, what's some of the worst things you've seen Warhammer crossed over with? Oh, gosh, that's a tough one. Um, I would probably say... I mean, I know it's done in humor, but some of the some of the Flash gets animations. I'm not sure if you've seen their crossovers between 40k and uh, some of the the furry community. 
Um, but some of those are. <laughs> I'm not sure if you've seen them. They're they're a little degenerate, perhaps. <laughs> I think there's I think there's a subreddit about. That. <laughs> oh, there's a subreddit about everything. Oh, okay, yeah, there, cool. But... <laughs> That's rule thirty-five of the internet. That if there if it exists, there's a subreddit about it. Mm-hmm. Uh, Danny, what about you? What's the worst crossover you've seen uh, from Warhammer Forty Thousand? Uh, basically, any time where they try and compare a Space Marine to Master Chief or a Space Marine mm-hmm. to Darth Vader, like I don't want to watch any of that. Why not? Is it, is it because Master Master Chief has been so beautifully taken care of in this rendition of the Halo TV series mm. in a very respectful way that is true to the lore in all senses? Mm-hmm. I mean, while that's true, John, um, absolutely, I think it's I think it's really important uh, to note that it brings up us the the same debate you see with Space Marine uh, players around the world. Um, why would you take your helmet off so much? <laughs> <laughs> why master chief is the same i think my only experience is like i saw a beautifully painted and converted uh my little pony army uh, of space marines which like i've never wanted to see a beautifully created art destroyed so quickly uh and with so much fire um but that that was out in the world there it was it was not a good time how does that um, stack up against the the hello the hello kitty necrons have you seen yeah. that army classic yeah that is i mean they're they're both like in a fight between My Little Pony Space Marines and Hello Kitty Necrons, no one wins. Like, the, the person, <laughs> both players just want to make the other person have an awful time for two and a half hours. So when both of them come up together, no one has a bad time. They have a good time because they have a terrible <laughs> taste in armies uh, and crossovers. Uh, so it's just an awful time. Uh, I will say, uh, better safe than sorry here, guys. And because we don't want to get into legal trouble like we did for making fun of signals from the Frontline co-host and famed Tau General and Space Marine Master Seth Oster, uh, we did this. Uh, this, This thumbnail, completely fixed. Uh, We just throw Seth's face on everything. No more legal challenges. Wonderful. (laughs) I I have to say I really wish we would have used the face of him behind the dolphin. Um, he looks so he looks so much happier in that picture. Like maybe the only time I've ever seen him happy. I will say, and, and this isn't just because uh, I went through his Facebook profile pictures and picked one uh, that I could use. Um, he was actually in that picture um, at a large event holding a replica chainsword, so he should have been happy. But instead, if you look at the picture again, he looks in pain. Uh, so, so maybe that picture is just uh, the, the the chainsaw is maybe a little too heavy for his. <laughs> it's his probably week. the hernia. Probably the hernia. Mm. Yeah. For, for oh, there wow. you go. And, uh, yeah, here is the Hello Kitty Necron army. Uh, Super producer Val found for us. Um, if you I mean, guys, okay, you Man. spend a hundred fifty dollars for for that premium event ticket. You spend five hundred dollars on plane tickets. You spend like five hundred bucks in a hotel room. You create an army. You paint an army. You get everything together to go to this one event, and you're paired against someone who decided to make a Hello Kitty Necron army. Uh, Danny, starting with you here, what, what do you do? Well, John, everybody gets to experience the hobby in their own way, and so do even if know? I find it completely dis- distasteful and abhorrent, I'm not going to shit all over their good time. So I'm just going to play a game against them and have fun. Sam, are you able to have a good time against this monstrosity here? And I believe we're looking at the My Little Pony Marines. You know, I would I'd honestly, you know, I think I'd have a hard time. You know, I at first feel the need to cascade them for not using 100% Games Workshop miniatures. <laughs> then I would pick up my army of little metal teddy bears with guns that I use for my Imperial Guard. And I would go play against <laughs> yeah. someone else. So yeah, I have a whole. I, this is also, um, I my life is a continual list of games and product lines that get get dis, uh, discontinued shortly after I buy into them. But I have a line of about sixty um, little metal teddy bears in like uh, pith helmets and little red coats. They have little guns. There's a whole line of them. They got like heavy weapon emplacements. I green stuffed some guys on the old like Taurus Venators into teddy bears. I just can't remember the whole theme. It was um, a rather tragic attempt to get my wife into the hobby that took yeah. on a life of its own uh, afterwards. But um, uh-huh. so, uh, from I, what I have I'm... no problem with that, if that's what you're asking. 
from from what what I'm hearing uh, from our producer producer Val here, after you said that everything you touch gets canceled, he's telling me you're not allowed to buy into the old world at all because he's really excited about it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, that's, you know that's cool. They burn short, but they burn bright, so it'll be great. <laughs> Oh. Man, we don't have enough Blade Runner co- uh, quotes on this show. That that is that is for sure. Um, guys, uh, is this a crossover episode? Because Funhouse streamer and all around top person Alana Pierce uh, caught my eye on Twitter uh, with this video game specific tweet, but it lends itself really well to the 40k community uh, too. Uh, she says, "Way too many of y'all watch YouTubers who are trying to make you angry. They turn one tweet they don't like into a 10 minute angry rant because making you mad is very engaging." And thus makes them money, but it's also just straight up bad for your health. Get out of there. Uh, guys, we've spoken in the past few weeks about some of these YouTubers who kind of uh, corral around uh, negativity here. But for both of you guys here, starting with Danny, um, why do you think aggressively negative content has seen such kind of a rise over the last year or so? Uh, man, nothing, nothing makes people angrier than people with really terrible opinions. Uh, so yeah, I mean, you get <laughs> people, chat is so active. <laughs> right. Yeah. You get people out there, you get like discourse, people like that, or you just, just have absolutely garbage opinions or arch and like, you know, uh, it's, they, they get, they get a lot of views partially because they have terrible fan bases. Um, but also because they have a terrible message. Yeah. Sam, why do you think that, that, that we've seen, and again, specifically the past couple of years, the rise of this. Uh, negativity core that kind of just kind of play to, to everyone's hatreds. Yeah, I, th- I think one of the reasons might be that I feel like there was a huge influx of players in about 8th edition. And I think some of those players are starting to kind of go through the GW cycle of where things might be, you know, kind of start really good. They start going downhill progressively. Uh, I'm thinking of like, like I know I started in 4th edition 40k which wasn't necessarily a great time but it was pretty decent and then fifth was pretty popular and then gray knights came and everything kind of got changed a little bit more complex uh and kind of slid into the the morass that was seventh edition um 40k so i think there's a lot of newer players here who aren't quite familiar with games workshop or maybe the the games workshop they know is just one that's very engaged with the community it's kind of like a kind of a good guy games workshop uh and so they're like they're more feeling perhaps for the first time of like, oh, how could you do this to us? Uh, or why could you make this decision that, that makes the game worse? Or don't you play test your rules? I've noticed over the past several books, like codices, that the, the rules don't seem terribly balanced. Um, yeah. So that would be my bet. I think there's some people who just aren't quite as familiar with kind of the, the things that Workshop has done in the past. And so it's a little bit more shocking for them. Yeah, and we're going to jump into some, because chat got a little bit more active over this one here. Um, but before we, we jump to, to their opinions on this here, um, do you feel that the streamers and the content creators are to blame for this? Or do you think it's the fault of the audience who are kind of latching on? Because these are videos that are getting crazy amount of views, like great positive traction for, for people kind of, yeah, I agree with this. Like, where does kind of the blame lie on this, hmm. Sam? Yeah, it reminds me of one of those old, I'm not sure if you ever saw those old demotivator posters, which were like the very cynical, like motivational posters. One of my favorite ones from that that's relevant that said that no single raindrop thinks it's responsible for the flood. Um, so, I, but I would say I sort of split between both both people. I mean, I think there's a bit of a, a toxic feedback loop where somebody sees something that's very <laughs> negative on a video and they want to share it because it sort of justifies their own cynical beliefs. Um, uh, and then it kind of get gets amplified from there. Um, I'm not sure how you necessarily stop that that process, yeah. um, but I would say I'd say it's pretty evenly split between the between the two. Danny, I was going to go to you on this, but I think he just said the most like deep, meaningful thing that's ever been like mentioned. Yeah. Uh, by drops of rain and the flood here, um, I want to point out here, Mark of Corn, <laughs> let us know <laughs> that. Uh, the irony of spending time talking about the negativity when the tweet was about not spending energy on the <laughs> negativity. Tom Marks, I uh, absolutely agree. Uh, look at me selling out for content yet again. Uh, and then oh, giving no. call. So rage fuels clicks, uh, perhaps as a sign of the feelings towards the current edition and how GW has been treating the hobby. Mm-hmm. I would say, though, that uh, the way GW has been treating the hobby as of late 
isn't terrible uh, compared to historical uh, facts and the, the way it's been treated before. I mean, Danny, would you ag- agree that GW isn't treating the current edition well uh, or how uh, a GW hasn't been treating the hobby well? Well, all right. So this is like, a, I, I feel like this is going to be a little nuanced because it, there's some important oh, distinctions. There's no place for nuance here. God. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, all right. I was not informed that this would be a nuanced <laughs> show when I agreed to come yeah, on. Yeah, no, you're right. No. Okay. Fair enough. <laughs> go, like, go, it's go, a Danny. shade of gray. It's a shade of gray, right? Like, um, it feels like there's some fall down in the balance like eighth edition had like even though while we were in the thick of it it seemed pretty like the balance seemed bad like it wasn't as bad as it is now um like in hindsight right and it was better than it had ever been so we all have this super high expectation of where they're going and so since ninth is backpedaled a little bit on that i think it's easy for a lot of people to look at the game and go like well the game is garbage now the hobby's bad but like If you look at the books that have been released and you look at the content and you look at the way the armies play, like they play like the background. And honestly, the rules are more flavorful than they ever have mm-hmm. been. Uh, like they're more, like the armies are more fun to play, even if they're not necessarily always fun to play against. And the codex lag is real. Like it's kind of disappointing that like all the books haven't been released yet and things like that. And I get the disappointment mm-hmm. there. Um, like we are not seeing this full game. And then as soon as we see the full game, like, does it just reset anyway, like with 10th edition? And so that's like kind of a scary place to be. So I have to give them a little bit of leeway here. Mm-hmm. Uh, but ultimately, I don't think the game is like, I don't think Games Workshop is treating the game poorly. I think they're trying their, I think they're trying really hard to show that, yeah, we do care about the state of the game. Um, like with some of like these balance updates, the balance update mm-hmm. was great. Like it was mm-hmm. good. Um, so did it fix everything? No, not yet. Um, but <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Daddy is laughing, uh, by the way, at a comment, uh, from yeah. super Super producer and frontline great gaming network, creative director, Val <laughs> saying she'll count one. <laughs> See if we can pump those numbers. Oh, those are anyway, numbers. So uh yeah, from, from this shill to the audience, I've I've just gotta say that uh I really I really like where the game is headed. I hope it gets edited in uh an even better direction than it already is in, and I think it will be in the future. Mm-hmm. No, no, Sam, your series kind of of articles in Frontline Gaming, there is some Warhammer Fantasy Battle content, uh, but mainly it kind of focuses on the crusade and narrative side of it. Would you agree with what kind of what Danny said about the Codex as feeling more like the army and kind of more flavorful in that way? Oh, yeah, 100%. To, to bump that show counter up to two here, I would say that it's <laughs> literally never been a better time yes. to play in the narrative field. It's never been easier. I mean, if you think about this, I'm not sure if you guys have looked at some of the Crusade mission packs that they've released, but the the sheer number of options that you have there to play are are staggering. And I know this is a very small, small part of the player base, but they've actually developed, like kind of done the impossible and developed uh, fun three to four player battles, which I thought was like almost impossible to do. If anybody else has tried to figure out how you set up equal deployment zones with three people, facing off against each other it's it's not an easy task yeah um so and that mission yeah. pack is fun right like yeah it's really, oh, it's really it. fun yeah. yeah 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 and so um yeah so the, the amount of content that's out there for whether you're like sort of a gm who's trying to have like a, a structured ladder campaign you want like a specific mission from like assaulting a beachhead or trying to stop them from call like an, an enemy from calling in reinforcements you have those already sort of packaged and ready to go and uh and yeah i love the flavor in the individual crusade uh rules in the codexes i think some of them need some help i think poor necrons and space marines uh their their rules are a little uh a little weak in terms of they go around trying to to get names pretty much um and so they suffer from some of the other ones but i think i think the the bones are there and they'll keep adding on to it uh, as they go yeah. forward, so I'm yeah I'm really excited. I I think the Crusade system is is almost perfect in terms of giving you a very open system to build on. Like the yeah. uh, the Tau and Tyranid stuff that they've come out with, with like con- either conquering the worlds through diplomacy or war, and then also devouring worlds is so cool. Like what uh, amazingly written rules. 
Yeah, the one thing that the one small beef I have with this is that if you're trying to like like I've tried to build some of my narrative campaigns with a very like very story built built in like a single sector, so you have to try and figure out how to accommodate like accommodate that. It's like oh, I guess that main planet that we're gonna have this big final battle on. I guess it just got both simultaneously eaten by the Tyranids, uh, overrun by the Dune Sea Cult, and liberated by the Tau. So I have no idea how that works, but you guys figure it out. <laughs> and then just because our shield counter is dangerously high right now, I just want to point out that the Warhammer is in trouble, guys. The fact that I'm not receiving a brand new codex every week uh, to review is a travesty. The fact that any faction's win rate is above 15% means mm -hmm. the game is completely broken. And the fact that I am not getting any kind of like feedback or... Chaos Knights, uh, which only I just want two of them. That's all I want is two Chaos Knights. Uh, means that Games Workshop is a terrible company that is absolutely not pulling old boxes out to add a new sprue so you can make any Chaos Knight from the same kit. It is deplorable. Whew. Terrible. Uh, guys, uh, moving back to some normal things here. Uh, we're going to stick with Twitter for a little bit as we return to the warm, welcoming and judgmental wings of an old friend, Peter the Duke, the Falcon Calissimo, uh, with his thoughts on competitive versus narrative, which has been causing some beef on Twitter recently here. Mm -hmm. uh, Pete says, uh, so there's another narrative versus competitive battle going on, I guess. Uh, as with every other hobby, I recommend you stop generalizing, become introspective, and realize you're all bad people. Think you're above it? Nope, you're the baddie. Agree <laughs> with me? Baddie. You are me? Baddie. Um, stirring stuff. Sam, this is your wheelhouse. Mm -hmm. uh, what's your take on the never-ending uh, competitive... And I did see that very quickly in screenshot. As Val just put up on screen, I did screenshot that a minute after it posted. Uh, my notifications uh, from Falcon tweets. John, uh, famously thirsty for content Quinnell over here. Like, I think... The way I view uh, Peter the Falcon tweet is the same way that I uh, Commissioner Gordon views the bad signal. Just throws that out there and expects an instant response. Uh, I love mm -hmm. it there. And now I know, uh, thanks, Val, to, to uh, the censor the timestamps on things. Uh, but Sam, this is your wheelhouse. What's mm -hmm. your take on the age-old competitive versus narrative debate? Oh gosh, it's always a fun one. I remember when when, the, when I first started playing in some competitive games back in fourth edition one of the big arguments about whether posting your list online for other people or like getting a list ideas from other people online whether that was that was bad form or not because it's net listing and then you don't want to be one of those people um uh, you don't want to have like an effective list you have to kind of generate it all in your mind um yeah, so I think I think that's one of the great things about Crusade is that it's kind of given an avenue for people who kind of want to split off and have something that's a little bit more like, well, not more like blatantly unbalanced, um, but more kind of fun and, and more sort of set up around. So like a beer and pretzels kind of like you kind of go there just to, to have a cool story and, and take part in something bigger. And then you if you want to like a tighter real rule set, you have those competitive events. I think you can never extract the two unless you have two completely different sets of rules. One for the competitive and one for the for the narrative. Um, one of the things I'm really going to be curious to see is going to be with the release of uh, the Horus Heresy systems, because it sounds like they're they're kind of going for like a hybrid between seventh and sort of ninth edition. And I'll be curious to see if there's a crusade, uh, sort of like a variation on that, or mm -hmm. um, because Horus Heresy seems like it, like a very narrative driven rule set for the most part. Um, maybe because it it and it was really too young to have too many competitive scenes well, right when it was sort of in its heyday, right before the addition of eight. Um, so I'm curious, yeah, just to see how they'll handle that going forward. Yeah. Danny, now my, my original question here is kind of what was your take on it here? But it was pointed out in chat that the narrative guy starts his answer by telling a story. So I want you to tell me <laughs> your opinion of the narrative versus competitive debate, but do not tell me it in story form. <laughs> well, John is a young man. <laughs> I, <laughs> uh, uh, as a young man, I quickly learned to ignore all the things that Peter posted uh, in any kind of meaningful <laughs> way because they're all just uh, a, they're all just a vehicle for his for his twisted sense of humor. Um, but 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 no, seriously though, like 
Um, I honestly, like, I am not, despite the fact that I play in a lot of tournaments and things like that, I actually would prefer to play narratively over competitively in general. I just go to tournaments because I get to play a bunch of games mm-hmm. in one day. Um, so, uh, and I mean, yeah, do I like winning? Yeah, sure. Who doesn't? Um, <laughs> oh, uh, guys, someone ch- commented earlier, putting the live and live stream. And yeah, right now, <laughs> the fight says every single thing that superstar producer Val is posting is making Danny and I crack up. It's, uh, in it's chat. not fair. First of all, like if I want to pay attention to the stream chat now, I can't because I'm just going to be distracted by jokes McGee behind the scenes here, just uh, <laughs> typing up random bullshit. Um, but no, it's, it's really good. Uh, I'm glad we have him uh, here tonight, uh, despite his technical ineptitude. Um, <laughs> hey, that's not fair. We were all on screen when the show started today. You know, yeah, he, he did do that. He did do that. Uh, even with the super slow trombone intro that I got. Uh, I think that was a stylistic choice more than anything else. Yeah. This is where he pulls me off the screen. Is he telling me to wrap it up? <laughs> He's playing you out, man. <laughs> oh. um, but no, really, like, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of things in common with these two groups of people. And it would be, I mean, they're all playing mostly the same game. So uh, why have the division? I don't know. They're both really fun. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think the important thing to remember is uh, uh, what the Falcons said here is that we're all bad people. You're a bad mm-hmm. person, too. Mm-hmm. Um, the, <laughs> the important thing to remember, though, is that no one is a bad person if they, <laughs> boom, help me find two chaos knights at a reasonable price. Uh, <laughs> Love it. Wonderful. Moving on. Yeah. <laughs> Literally. Just let me buy it at retail. That's all I'm asking. Um, John, hold I, on. I have a question yeah. for you. Yeah. Okay. So that thermometer. Yes. How many, like, how many degrees does it have? Because it feels like there's room for a lot of nights with those hash marks on there. I'm going to be real. I Googled charity thermometer picture. <laughs> Uh, uh-huh. And this was the one that came up that I was like, yeah, that'll kind of fit probably. Um, I originally, when I designed this slide, wanted to have the desecrator facing the other way, but GW doesn't do product pictures from the other side. And it turns out when you mirror stuff, text changes. So yeah, yeah, um, that, that was stylistic oh, sure. choices. The struggle is real. That, so, that's a complicated. That's a complicated mirror job, there, John. I understand. You know what else is complicated? Buying two chaos nights in this Mary. current environment. Incredibly I'm sure that would make the, any struggles with text go a lot smoother if you had those <laughs> waiting for you at home. It absolutely does. But hey, uh, moving on. Uh, last week's Imperial Knights and Chaos Knights got the unbalancing they so richly deserved um, and had their objective secure removed, uh, proving again uh, that GW was <laughs> right in knowing that objective secured knights are overpowered and bad for the game. Uh, but Warhammer 40,000 again proved that it was a perfectly balanced game later in the week as the balanced data slate was itself rebalanced, giving Knights back their objective secured with Games Workshop knowing they were a little underpowered and they needed objective secured. Ah, um, the famous Danny, balanced data slate for the balanced data slate. Mm-hmm. That, that's right. I, uh, thank you, Chad. I did wait too long to chase the meta. Thank you. Um, <laughs> Danny, why do you think objective secure was added back in after it was taken away? I, I'm contractually obligated not to not to say my reasoning, John. Um, oh, that's fair. Okay, Sam, what do you think uh, that they added uh, objective secured back in there? Uh, just a you know a clear lack of moral spine. They should have just you know stuck with the decision and gone with it. In my opinion, man, yeah, you know, they knew what they were doing the whole way. And they just backtracked. It's sad. Like, it's a sad day for the game. It's a sad day for the hobby. It's a sad day for all of us. <laughs> screw, like, screw you guys. Also, thank you, chat. Even if there are two Powerpuff Girl themed night desecrators on eBay, I'm not going to buy them, regardless of how cheap they must be. Uh, uh, Sam, are you expect, were you expecting this kind of level of response from GW uh, on this? Because we had a balanced data slate came out. They, they adjusted things to take objective secured away from the Knights with the reasoning that they had their own codex coming soon. Did you expect them within a week to, to redress that based off of feedback? No, I, I, I was actually quite shocked that they would do that because I figured they would just roll with whatever they had in the codex, especially when they were releasing um, in the rumors. It looked like you were kind of getting hints that, that objective secured would work a little bit differently for Knights than it has in the past. I, I figured they would just, um, just keep it 
keep it rolling until that book. I mean, I'm not sure when that book comes out. Maybe it's going to come out further in the longer time uh, than we than we give it credit for. Um, but yeah, uh, hey, hats off them. They they made it work for those those three night and two chaos night players who are out there keeping it real. Yeah. Well, there should be three, but I can't buy a Chaos Knight anywhere, apart from Canada, apparently, when I'm not prepared to go to that length. My fate um, worse than death. My fate yeah. worse than death. Um, here we go. No time for some amazing model engineering I found uh, on Reddit. Uh, um, boy, am I impressed with this. Uh, they use Lego pieces uh, to, uh, quote unquote, magnetize their predator there. So instead of a magnet on the Predator turret, they use a, a few Lego pieces, which I was like, well, I never thought of that before. But also, I can't think of a hobby more expensive than Warhammer, uh, aside from Lego, which is equally expensive. <laughs> Guys, uh, I want some of your hobby aha moments where you're like, man, that is really good. And people should know about this. Uh, we're going to start here with Danny. Uh, what are some of your aha moments where you're like, man, that really works? Well, John... Uh, when I was a young boy growing up in Alaska, um, I really had... Apparently in chat, there's a drinking comp uh, competition starting for every time you say the word narrative, so let that inform your choices. When I was a young narrative player growing up in Alaska, um, I, I, I had to make a model go really far. And so uh, initially, I, was, I had used, like, on my plastic models, I had used super glue. Um, all this time, I used super glue, I used accelerator... Uh, like Bob Smith's uh, cyanoacrylate um, super glue, which you can find at any local hobby store um, for a reasonable price. Um, even with your logo on it, you can get your hobby store's logo on it. So mm. buy Bob Smith's cyanoacrylate. <laughs> um, Shell count is at three. It's now. really, it's uh, <laughs> it's really great. Um, but no, for real, it sucks. It sucked for plastic models because my stuff would just break apart because I was a, uh, uh, I was terrible at keeping my models in a safe place. So. Uh, I started using uh, like testers glue in a bottle, like, you know, the squeeze mm. bottle and it would come yeah. out and it would make my model really terrible. Like it would squeeze out all over the joints. But then, but then I got a job at the hobby shop and mm. I, I was talking with the genius plastic modelers there, the guys who build tanks and that kind of stuff and airplanes. And they pointed me to the model master, a uh, black bottle with a metal tip. Uh, mm -hmm. with the metal applicator and guys that is just absolutely the best way to build your models however unfortunately as i say this uh they discontinued that <laughs> that product uh, fairly recently so uh you know i, I just to... bought my first bottle of it and wouldn't you know <laughs> yeah right um uh i used it for probably almost a decade uh, and then it got canceled because, uh, like, uh, Model Master went out of business, I think. They got mm. bought up. Oh, I thought you were going to say it got canceled company. because of its, like, views on things. <laughs> yeah, it was, you, it was, it was Me Too stuff. Uh, uh, just it, kidding, just it's, kidding. It's, uh, that was a bad It stuck joke. to um, something it shouldn't have. Yeah. <laughs> it said some things. <laughs> um, but I, uh, I found that I can ship over uh, some Ravel stuff. They have, uh, like, a Ravel product that's pretty close. Um, uh, mm -hmm. that has a metal applicator tip, which is what I really wanted. Um, then I just have to pay like $30 in shipping for three bottles. So, um, if it's worth it to you, it's worth it. Yeah. Uh, Sam, what about you? What are, what are some, aha, like this is my yeah. hobby secret. I think, uh, I'm not sure it's, it's necessarily a well-kept secret. One of the things I remember when I first started making models, I thought to myself, why would I need a wash? because the miniature is still going to have sort of like the shadows are going to fall on the miniature where they would in, in real life because it's just like real life except smaller so why on earth would i need a wash like what's it possibly it's just like you know it's just one of those expensive things that you don't really need because it's not going to make it look more realistic and then i think it was i think it was the first time i was painting a model with chain mail for you guys like, no maybe i should give this wash thing a try just because you know for the little small holes big difference and then Ever since then, I've applied way too much wash to all my models because I just sort of treat it as my get out of jail free card. Where I'm like, oh, my blending didn't go too well. Well, we'll just slap a couple, a couple coats of null oil on that and call it a day. Um, I don't recommend that, but it is like like when your guests said in your past episode, it is they're like they like nights that they do compensate for a lack of skill. <laughs> <laughs> uh, for sure. And then chat coming in strong with some great suggestions here. Adhering decals to aluminum foil is great for banners. Uh, huh. We have uh, to me a panel liner as being life changing. Ooh, yeah. uh, and then guitar string mecha tendrils. 
Yeah, which guitar was, string makes great cabling. Yeah, huh. guitar string Mecha Tendrils, uh, my my favorite uh, Massive Attack song uh, from the last <laughs> twenty years. It's when when Val, you need the 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 joke, so people know that that I'm trying to be fun. <laughs> Perfect. 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 <laughs> Well, as soon as that's I figure out where that's from, uh, we're going to go. Yeah, we were playing now. The absolute professionalism. Um, <laughs> that's what we really. No. That's what we really emphasize here on Grim After Dark. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> yeah, and then thank you, Chad. Yeah, Val is too busy mocking us as we try our hardest to be really bad uh, once a week. Uh, hey, the second-hand market though continues to be an appropriate avenue to find that perfect model. And uh, unlike no, Frontline Gaming's <laughs> very reasonable secondhand store found at FrontlineGaming.org, uh, this little Maliceptor uh, found by our superstar editor, Tyler, seems to be a smidge <laughs> overpriced um, at $325 on eBay. Um, guys, one, and we're going to start here with Sam, have you ever taken advantage of the secondary market to make some cash on a model? Okay, uh, I guess I'm not sure I should admit to this in public. So one of the things I tried doing for a little bit, uh, what I thought would be a good idea, was going to estate sales that had Warhammer stuff and then buying that and then trying to resell it on eBay. That is grimdark. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, <laughs> and so trying was trying to barter with people um, to, to, to try and get the, the cost down as low as possible. I mean, I had some successes. I got like almost a full box of of a uh, free guild militia um, from Warhammer Fantasy, which if you don't know, that's like that's like one of the rare finds, and you can that's get cool. that. It has all those options. Uh, but then, at, and I so quickly realized that that even with my my insane bartering skills, I was still barely breaking even once you factored in shipping and everything, and eBay fees. But yeah, if you if you want to give it a shot, you can find some uh, interesting interesting uh, state sales if they I have something just you love. like. I just love the idea of you going into this person's house and be like, so sorry for your loss. This unit is trash. I'll give you like 20 bucks. <laughs> it's, it's, it's what he would have wanted. He would have wanted it to go to the good home. Here's my pictures of all my painted models. You can, they'll, they'll be joining them. Here's my references. <laughs> Here's my photoshopped eBay price showing exactly. that it's just going for like $4 for the unit. Exactly. Uh, but Danny, what about you? Have you ever tried to make a quick buck on, on some Warhammer models? No, no. <laughs> Quite honestly, why? No. Why are you the only good person? Look, because no, like, really. and <laughs> I, I sell models for way there, below yeah. retail because I want people to be able to get into the hobby and enjoy stuff, and so I really like to know my models are going to a good home. Yeah. Um, back a few years ago, if you bought a void shield generator or a plasma oh, generator gosh. for roughly <laughs> four times above retail, I'm sorry, that was me. <laughs> Um, I appreciate your 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 willingness to purchase it, but yeah, right right on that the, the initial FOMO there, I did take advantage of one too many people. And I, I mean, yeah, John, you know, at least you didn't take advantage of some dead people to get to make a quick buck on eBay. <laughs> hey, I didn't yeah. take it. I took advantage of the families. It's an important, subtle oh, difference. Sorry, so so some families grieving over a death, like you, yeah, good. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm just love him. <laughs> Would either of you guys uh, buy a, a Malceptor uh, for that price, that, that ridiculous three hundred dollars price? Uh, uh, starting with you, Danny. Uh, how much do I need one? I guess that's <laughs> kind of uh... okay. What is the situation where you would spend three hundred and twenty-five dollars for a Malceptor? Like, I need it to win a tournament, like a big one. So yeah. maybe. Uh, so you're not doing it not. for like sixty bucks a store credit. We're talking about like GT or higher. Right. Yeah. I'm not going to spend. Look, I, I needed to. I, I'm. Not, I'm not going to spend the money to try and make sixty bucks. Like I'm not breaking even at that point, right? So, uh, pr but I'm probably not going to do that. I'll probably just figure out something else or borrow one from somebody. Mm -hmm. uh, plus, I already have two malceptors. I really don't need it. <laughs> Uh, I just want to say there's several counts going through this chat, including Warhammer Fantasy Battle uh, references. Uh, our bold faced <laughs> lie count is now at least three, <laughs> according to chat. Uh, Sam, uh, what circumstance would you spend $300 on a Malceptor? I would buy it if I knew somebody else really wanted one. And Whoa! Very, 
<laughs> well, only if they were very, very discerning with them. Once again, I guess I'm, I'm not establishing myself as a very upstanding person here. My <laughs> person. Chef. Chat, let, let's, let's start like an upstanding <laughs> citizen count. Or is Sam merely trying to come back from a uh, wedding crasher style, like going to, to estate sales and getting you guys? Yeah. We have a rare beast on the show tonight. We have the the, the narrative bad guy. <laughs> <laughs> I I just I wanted to I just wanted to make sure everyone knows that because that doesn't happen very often. Normally pretty nice guys, but Sam, yeah, yeah, don't yeah thank you. <laughs> yeah, you love to thank you, it. Mark. Thank you, Mark of Cornade. Upsetting citizen count minus one when really it should be <laughs> minus three. Um, uh, <laughs> well, let's let's take a little break here from all the fun we're having. Uh, we got to remind you guys, uh, F- F- Frontline Gaming has full color terrain back in limited quantities. Um, and this is your chance to get some of the highly sought after FLG full color terrain and a 15% discount on any FLG mats you purchase along with the terrain set. Uh, these guys are going to sell out quick, so to be sure to act now. Uh, this week is going to be the amazing full color orc town complete set. The terrain looks amazing. Uh, it's probably better than pro painted. It's better than I can paint for sure. And it will impress on the tabletop. And to complete the look, remember, when you buy an FLG mat at the same time, uh, you will see 15% off the map. And let me tell you guys, Scrubland is a desert mat that goes perfectly with this terrain set. Uh, it looks great. And all the terrain is super good. Uh, thank you, Frontline, for letting us make terrible jokes uh, about a city of sales once a week. Uh, <laughs> moving on to more narrative questions uh, with this next question here. I guess you don't get a chaos night at no additional charge. I've already asked that, and it doesn't happen. Yeah. Uh, moving on to I the next slide. Say, I was shocked this wasn't another, you know, beg for a chaos night kind of a situation. Here. <laughs> no. I have to do something straight. Um, but yeah, as you guys can clearly see, our Chaos Night Camp is still at zero. Um, moving on to uh, more narrative questions here for Sam. Um, this comes here from Reddit, from the Warhammer 40k subreddit. What do y'all think felonids look like? There's no canonical description of felonids. Do you think they're stereotypical anime cat boys or hairy, ugly ones? Sam. I oh, know. Oh, gosh. Um... I have really no, no, I mean, I, th- I think if I had to, was like at gunpoint, which is the only way I would answer this question. Uh, well, besides this, this situation, apparently, um, <laughs> is, uh, I would say, I know, I'd go something out of Skyrim. I think, I think Skyrim got it right in, in Oblivion with the, the Khajiit, at least in terms of their, their appearance. I think it's, it's a pretty solid right. pick. I mean, again, that wasn't an option. You had the option of stereotypical anime cowboys or hairy, ugly ones. Uh, that those were two two options. <laughs> I just felt I know I felt those were I felt I had a wider range, you know, that were <laughs> that were, they were out there. I felt like the the, the option was as totally inclusive com- of the felonated. As experience. a competitive show, we have to go <laughs> options as written and not options as intended. Mm. All right, I'd probably yeah. go with an anime cat voice thing. Yeah, yeah. Danny, uh, your answer, would you go uh, the, the stereotypical anime cat boys or hairy, ugly ones? No, I'd go this. The person who wrote this tweet is a fucking idiot. A <laughs> is, just, is, is, is just a big cat. It's just a, it's just a fucking cat. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, on that, I did investigate a little deeper, and we found the same user uh, posted this question on Ask Reddit. Which was furries of Reddit? <laughs> what is your furry horror story? And for me, <laughs> for me personally, it was this entire question. Uh, that that mm. was my furry horror story. Guys, uh, the new edition. We talked about it earlier. The new edition of the Horus Heresy is coming faster than a copy of Nemesis flies into a trash can. <laughs> and last week, Games Workshop previewed uh, the all plastic Spartan, uh, loyalist or traitor. Who cares and the internet rejoice with... Wait, well, no. Wait, what? They complained about it? Well, at least it's going to be content for us here. Uh, as this person here responded with, I would have bought it if it wasn't for the fact that the leak showed that they have basically killed the Space Wolves. And so six years of army building and collecting went to complete waste. Uh, which one, I think it was six years ago that the horse heresy were, like ended being relevant. Uh, that might just be me. But Sam, how concerned should people be about bad rules from a two-year-old playtesting document that got leaked from an anonymous source? 
First of all, if you're a Space Wolf player, you should, you're should you wrong and you should feel bad. I have no sympathy for you. Those rules were, like, specifically in, in Horus Heresy, the Space Wolves were obscene when they came out. They were so good. They were up there with the Thousand Sons with being some of the most broken ones there. But, yeah, I mean, I don't think you can trust anything in a two-year-old document. There's some stuff. That I think we saw it with some of the Eldar rumors that some of the things that were rumored, even from a pretty reliable source, ended up not being true. They're getting changed at the last minute. Uh, sometimes DW gets cold feet on something, and they actually listen to their playtesters. Um, most times they don't. Um, but, sometimes they shouldn't. Hello. Yeah, sometimes they should. Sometimes they shouldn't. Um, so I wouldn't. I wouldn't judge it too too much. I mean, plus we've seen. I mean, how many armies competitively have been buried before they've been released, like Custodes or some other ones Four. out there? Four. Okay, exactly. Yeah, four. So you've got four. Yeah. So I mean. <laughs> <laughs> And if you know, if you know if Space Wolf don't pan out, then just paint a your Legion a better color and just move on from there. Yeah. That ain't Horus Heresy is being previewed every Thursday in the Warhammer community site. How have you found the previews so far? Very exciting, John. Um, I'm super excited to uh to make motorcycle noises as I drive my white scarf <laughs> across the table and uh screech autistically at my opponent when I take the Night Lords out. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, yeah, thanks, Jack. Call them filaments, uh, which is what Danny will be running in Horus Heresy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> moving on to YouTube, guys, this caught my eye. Uh, Ninjon telling us about eight products GW does not want you to know about while well, holding, holding what looks like a vape pen uh, to me per personally here. Uh, Sam, I didn't watch this because I don't watch any clickbait uh, at all, especially things mm -hmm. titled like Warhammer is no longer completely fixed. Um, but what do you think some of these products are going to be? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, probably one is a 3D printer just because it's, you know, nothing in those lists are ever as revolutionary as they promised. Um, but... No, they still... want you to only be frustrated with the game of Warhammer. They don't mm -hmm. want you to be frustrated with like cleaning and leveling of play yeah, and then that's... UV exposure. Yeah, maybe that's why I sort of I haven't been quite as, you know, stressed out over 40k recently is because I've been fighting with my 3D printer on an almost constant basis for the past couple of weeks. And so now I just have no time like, yeah, like yeah. What is it? Like I'm I'm going through my third L C D screen in two weeks and I don't know whether it's because the L C D is broken or if there's something else in the printer. <clears throat> Sorry. I, I, I want to imagine the, the the Games Workshop headquarters there's just like a giant screen where it's like number of three D printers sold in the world. Like every time someone buys it, it goes up by one and they're like, Oh god, we're like two minutes to <laughs> midnight. There's eight thousand of these things around now. Um, Danny, what about you? So 3D printers being one of them, what else does GW not want people to know about? Well, you know, John, I recently watched, uh, I watched a series on uh, YouTube uh, about the 12 things that uh, ancient astronauts were able to do that we aren't able to reproduce today. Hmm. And uh, I think this <laughs> video kind of falls into a similar category. That's Click fair. baby garbage. Mm. <laughs> We did touch on that earlier. I should organize these slides better. Um, guys, moving on, we have a take that is so hot and so fresh. It could have come from Danny, but instead it comes from like a decades old Simpsons episode uh, saying that, uh, wow, the fortune cookies here are really more accurate. And the fortune cookie says, 40K isn't expensive. You're just poor and lack basic fiscal obscurity. Uh, guys, is this true, Danny? Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I mean, I don't agree with the way that you pronounced austerity, but like I, <laughs> no, that isn't a C. Oh, look at that. Yeah, my notes <laughs> serves me right for going for the uh, draft quality print. Oh man, Com comparatively to a lot of other hobbies, forty uh, k is uh, is not that expensive. I feel like so. Yeah, uh, Sam, uh, did you want to take a, a shot at my ability to, to read, or did we just? Uh, I, I think Danny's done a great job with that already. Um, <laughs> okay, perfect. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, can, I can't improve on that. Um, yeah, I would say, I, like I said, I, I don't, I don't have money for not, well, enough other hobbies to give like a good answer about if it's more expensive than it or not, because uh, my funds are technically kind of monodirectional if you catch my drift. Um, but yeah, I don't think it's expensive as people think, I think it takes more effort to get from like, uh, from your purchase to the tabletop than a lot of ones. So it can feel a lot more, 
annoying when you you buy you spend a lot of time buying building something mm -hmm. and then you know it's either unusable or you can't find somebody to play or they don't play the right system. So I think that there's more like a feels bad man mm -hmm. moment for that. But I don't think on the, if you look at the pure cost, especially once you factor in the secondary market. Um, if we want to up our shield count again, we can go onto the Frontline Gaming's website, and their secondhand store has many options there. Reasonably priced. Brother, brother, you're not <laughs> you're not shilling. Uh, at that point, you're helping us pay the bills around here. No, um, no. And yeah, thank thank you, chat, uh, for pointing out all of the ways that I am an awful person and my ability to read. <laughs> and and also asking, can we just have an entire episode of Daddy and Guest roasting John? Uh, I think <laughs> you get week. that. We do that every week. Uh, live, live wherever the Frontline Gaming Network is found here. Um, Bell of Lost Souls, guys, coming in hot with this article, uh, letting us know Warhammer 40k stratagems should be leadership checks. Um, starting with uh, Danny here, would this actually improve the way a stratagem works? What even is this article? <laughs> God. Like... <laughs> I mean, I mean, I just <laughs> like, sure, if stratagems were unlimited use or something like that, like you didn't have a factor, there, there was resource management, like command points. Yeah, okay, yeah, maybe leadership checks would be a good idea, but like, it's not like you don't get to use them an infinite number of times during the game. So just let units be cool. That's the whole point of stratagems. Yeah, uh, Sam, how do, how do you envision a leadership check-based stratagem actually working in the game? Yeah. Like Danny was saying, like, right now, I mean, I didn't read the article. I just saw and laughed at the headline, uh, as I do with most of our stuff here. Mm -hmm. As Danny was saying, right now it's like a resource management thing. How does a leadership test work? Yeah, I think it's an admirable attempt to really solve the problem of games just going too quickly, and that there really needs to be an additional step. There needs to be more <laughs> dice roll. <laughs> yes. That's really what this author is getting at here, and I think it's a, it's a slightly misguided. Uh, way to way to approach. I have no idea how that would work. I don't think it would work well. I think it would require more tracking, and then you have to figure out. Well, did I do a leadership test? Like, even if you restrict like one stratagem per unit per phase, you say like, oh, did I did I did I do that for that unit or not? Oh, cool. um, yeah, yeah that'd be mad. I mean, I think if you wanted to, to I don't know. I'm not sure if they just want to get rid of the resource management site. Like, I think if you made them like a deck of cards. You could do something interesting like that. I think it would remove a lot of the fluffiness, and I think it would create a whole lot of other issues. But uh, if you wanted to simplify them, that's one way you could do it. Chat did come up with a great scenario that I now hate uh, alongside this, <laughs> where it was, if a stratagem is a leadership check uh, and you fail it, can you then use a reroll stratagem to reroll the check for your stratagem? <laughs> So you're, you then have to roll for leadership for the stratagem to re-roll for the stratagem <laughs> that you failed. Because um, I'm really happy you replied this way, because my next question on this is, what what's another way you could ruin the game with one simple change? Uh, starting, with, <laughs> starting with you, Sam. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm going to have to stick with my same answer, and I could expand it, because you could have all these branded cards. It, each deck would cost probably about $18 and be released as part, uh, separate from the codex as well. Uh, and then there would also be, you know, a lot of opportunities then to add in extra cards that are only available in White Dwarfs as well, uh, <laughs> that you can get, as well as, you know, for the additional books, uh, like the, the Crusade supplements and such, they could release, and they'll all have the same backing, so you'll never really know where it, where this particular card came from. There will be so many to track. This will just be perfect. I can't imagine a better way to do it. Guys, Danny, I'm going to move over to you and ask oh, you this man. question, but Chad Ch Ch already have... answered it. Chad already answered what, what I feel is a winner of a while off to determine the first turn. Oh, and I can't God. think of anything that would make me quit this hobby faster. Because I've dedicated decades of my life. I have <laughs> equipment otherwise to do things. And a while off would just kill my soul. Uh, but, Danny, what was your answer? Oh, yeah. So, uh, proprietary dice system. <laughs> 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 like, let's make all the rolls D20s or different sides of dice, depending on which faction it is, and then have different symbols that mean different things. So it's very difficult to determine what's a success and what's a failure. I think the, the, the patented Games Workshop D7 uh, mm. would, would work. Like a that's D7 a Nurgle system. dice, John. The D7. Yeah. <laughs> that's fair. Uh, that's absolutely fair. And oh, and so chat, I'm not, I, I fear saying this will bring it more oh, to life, but what if we brought the Age of Sigmar double turn oh, to 40K? Gosh. Man, 
Mark of Corn is on fire tonight. <laughs> yeah, man. I know we Whoa. started like like soliciting guests from chat, but buddy, you, you're you're getting up there. You you're getting there. Uh, hey, oh. anyway, uh, we're going to round out this week with one of our favorites, uh, the Tabletop Inquirer, uh, one of my favorite haunts on Facebook. Here, uh, please stop threatening him online so he'll come on the show. But hey, I want to present these two side by side for some analysis. Uh, we have the the Warcom team publishes article not about squats, as if anyone <laughs> cares. Because uh, that is a big thing right now. And then quickly followed by the coolest looking army army in the game. Totally sucks ass. Um, <laughs> guys, starting here with you, Sam. Do cool looking armies actually suck ass? Yeah, I think it's some unwritten rule. And I think the one time, you know, I think part of the problem is that any time that uh, cool looking armies do perform really well in the game, that's when you get people painting them really poorly. Like <clears throat> Adepticon, Cough Cough. Um, when you <laughs> to almost that try harder, bro. Just, <laughs> just try harder. I know with the like Harlequins, like especially you now with when they were good for like a couple weeks, all that all the airbrushed Harlequin armies. I mean, once again, they they look better than a lot of stuff that I can paint, but I can still say that they're, that they're trash. Fair, uh, Danny. Uh, will squats suck ass? With all of the information we have about them right now, yeah. that they are coming. And they're led by a computer. Yeah, uh, gonna be are they going to be bad? Yeah. Yeah, they're um, going to be terrible. And here's what are why. the what are they going to do that's going to ruin it for you? What like sorry? What are they going to do that's going to ruin it for me? Or what are they going to yeah. do that makes them bad in the game? Well, uh, tomato, tomato. So I think they're going to be like speed four or five, like movement mm -hmm. four or five, and that's going to be real bad. <laughs> what like do you feel about slow? Yeah, the ability to board a land train at the back. Uh, That's fair. The mark <laughs> <at> the <very laughs> front. If the land train is just a stratagem that they can pass with a successful leadership check, and they can just <laughs> teleport from objective to objective as those are "quote unquote" stops that the land train gets to take, then maybe they'll be good. Yeah. Awesome. I I, I hope they do that too in a way that's very easily abusable. Uh, but guys, we're gonna we're gonna finish up tonight. Uh, with a new segment, uh, which we're calling Competitive Dictionary, uh, where we try and demystify some of the terms that get thrown around uh, that you pretend to know the meaning of. Uh, this week, mm -hmm. uh, we have bubble wrap. Uh, Danny, why don't you take this away? Uh, what is bubble wrap based on this very well-produced slide? I'm sorry, so you want me to define something that we're currently looking at the definition yeah, of? If you want to just read the slide. Oh, sure, yeah. I can do that. <laughs> bubble wrap, noun bubble wrap <laughs> the act of screening your big guns with throwaway units either to act as a roadblock versus melee or to artificially deny your opponent's ability to deep strike see also coward mm -hmm. yeah i might have added in that little bit of flavor at the end there sam <laughs> um, have you often bubble wrapped uh, I don't like to admit it, uh, but yeah, I will occasionally, <laughs> especially in, you know, like in those aforementioned three or four player games, I ended up shuffling Magnus off to a corner once because somebody decided to deep strike him. And so he stayed there the entire game. Um, but yeah, I, I confess, especially with being either uh, Eldar or Imperial Guard, you, you're kind of forced to reduce to, to cowardice or uh, questionable bravery however you want mm. to define it. And so I have, I have resorted to bubble wrap in the past. Yeah. <laughs> Danny, what is the best unit to use as bubble wrap? Uh, the cheapest possible thing that you have, I would say. Um, also, I don't know. Like, yeah, it, and that depends on the army, right? Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I would say the best <clears throat> units are like guardsmen or something that's fast and cheap, like Gaunts or... Uh, uh, I use Necron Warriors a lot to bubble wrap my important mm. units. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, well, guys, thank you, Sam. Go ahead. Let people know where to find you. Uh, plug your stuff. Yeah. So I, I pretty much am just on uh, just on the uh, front line. Um, uh, uh, yep. There. I'm there. I am. It's 11 o'clock <laughs> here, people. I got nothing else to say. I'm just a freelance writer. <laughs> yeah. He does. Uh, Obviously under the not name, here again. But <laughs> I was going to say, under, under the name Lord Paddington, Lord he does Paddington, some amazing articles Gaming. on the Frontline Gaming uh, website. Uh, a lot of crusade narrative. And if you love Warhammer Fantasy Battle as much as uh, uh, Daddy and, and the person in my ear does, 
Uh, you'll love his stuff there too. Uh, I think we were all laughing at the fact that uh, Andrew DeSalt uh, asked, does Sam buy his bubble wrap at estate sales? Which was better than any joke I could have written. I grab it from the coffins. That's all I'm going to say. In, in a long time. <laughs> awesome. Uh, hey, guys. So exactly. next week, next week, do you like eardrums? Do you like coherent sentences? If the answer to both is no, then praise be as Taylor Pearson is back again. And this time we aren't even talking about a book. Uh, we're just going to be going through the last week in the Warhammer community. Sam, thank you for looking back at the last week in the Warhammer community with myself and Danny. Uh, we have been Grim After Dark, and we will see you next week. <laughs>